This is a presentation from the Center for Future Consciousness. An accelerative evolutionary history of science fiction from ancient times to the present. And I'm Tom Lombardo. And I should note right at the beginning, uh, a number of the uh, graphics that we have up here are by Terry Spatara, who's the producer of the series that I've been doing on science fiction. And this is one of her new and interesting works of art. And we'll see some more of them as we move along through the presentation. The mission of the Center for Future Consciousness is to advance the purposeful evolution of humanity through the heightening of future consciousness and wisdom and the inspirational mythic and cosmic power of science fiction. Now, today I'm going to be talking about how science fiction helps to facilitate the heightening of future consciousness and the uh, heightening of um our uh, understanding of how to purposefully evolve humanity. Now, the Center for Future Consciousness has a website, and on this website, there are numerous articles, uh, chapters from books and videos, which you can go look at anytime you're uh, of interest, and quite a few of them have to do with science fiction. The future, Center for Future Consciousness also publishes Future Consciousness Insights, a newsletter, and we have a YouTube channel on which there's over 100 hours of videos, many of which have to do with science fiction, but also many other topics pertaining to the future and psychology and consciousness. In fact, quickly, here's just simply an image of the various books that I've published in psychology, philosophy, consciousness, education, future studies and theories of the future, future consciousness and wisdom. But the talk I'm gonna be given today is based on a series of books that I'm writing on the evolutionary history of science fiction. So far, three books have been published in the series, Prometheus to the Martians, The Time Machine to Metropolis, and Superman to Star Maker. There's three other books that are being written right now, The Golden Age, The Silver Age, The New Wave, Star Wars, Hyperion, The Singularity, and beyond. Now, this entire history is covered in the webinar series that I have on science fiction, which is up on the YouTube channel for the Center for Future Consciousness. But if you're interested, I have a compressed history that I just recently written and will be published in the Handbook of Future Studies next year on science fiction futures, historical foundations, and contemporary developments. So the talk today is based upon all of this material, which I've been pulling together on the history of science fiction. Here's a quick outline of what I'll be covering today. And I divided it up into six color-coded chunks, introduction and, and the nature of science fiction, ancient history up through Jules Verne, evolution through Olaf Stapleton, the golden age through the new wave, the 1980s and the 1990s, and then the last two, uh, last two decades uh, in this new millennium. Now, the place I'm going to begin is with the question, what is science fiction? And here we have the four main characters from the TV series, The Big Bang, Sheldon, Leonard, Raj, and Howard, all dressed up in science and in, in Star Trek outfits. And these four characters live and breathe science fiction as if science fiction is a way of life for them. They read science fiction, they read comics, they watch science fiction on TV, they play science fiction video games, they go to science fiction conventions, they dress up in science fiction outfits, and Sheldon, in fact, identifies himself with a science fiction character, Mr. Spock from Star Trek. For them, science fiction is a way of life. Indeed, it is a paradigm in Thomas Kuhn's sense of paradigm for living and understanding reality in the future. 
They think it, they feel it, they behave it, they decorate their reality in it. Science fiction is a total way of life for them. Indeed, there are many different dimensions of human reality which science fiction gets into, and science fiction uh, stimulates holistic future consciousness. And by holistic future consciousness, I mean all of the different modes of experience and mental processes that people engage in when they think about and imagine and deal with the future. Science fiction has a dimension of literature. Science fiction is in the comics and graphic novels. Science fiction comes through cinema, TV, and radio. There are social communities and subcultures in science fiction. There is commercialization of science fiction through artifacts, collectibles. There's art and music. There's clothing and jewelry. There's icons and iconic characters. Science fiction fans have a shared history that they communicate with each other. There's science fiction scholarship and science fiction video gaming. There's probably thousands of science fiction websites. There's innumerable science fiction conventions that go on every year. And there's awards giving out, many, many different awards. In fact, science fiction has a science fiction hall of fame. So science fiction is not just simply in literature, science fiction permeates out through many, many different dimensions of human reality and heightens holistic future consciousness in many different ways. In fact, it's an illustration of someone who is relatively immersed and participates in science fiction. Here I am sitting in my science fiction room with my science fiction books and art and artifacts and knickknacks and letters from science fiction writers. And I participate in this kind of holistic reality, immersion into science fiction. So science fiction is something that really spreads out through many, many facets of human reality and consciousness. Now, because science fiction taps into holistic future consciousness, there is a specific and very important ramification to that. It is the most visible, popular, and influential contemporary form of future thinking and imagination in the modern world. And it is so popular because it speaks to the whole person. It stimulates and enhances all dimensions of human consciousness of the future. That is, it stimulates and enhances and actually uh, evolves holistic future consciousnesses, which is why it is so popular. But there's one feature to science fiction, which in particular uh, has a tremendous impact on holistic future consciousness. And that is that science fiction is futures narrative. Futures narrative stimulates holistic future consciousness because narratives are personally engaging. Humans have this psychological resonance with stories and narratives. Narratives provide humans with identity, personal identity, with meaning in life. They give humans value. They provide purpose and direction. Narratives are emotionally engaging. And so science fiction as futures narrative allows people to vicariously live and feel the future. As a definition of science fiction, it is a literary narrative approach that is primarily, although not exclusively, about the future, involving dramatic plots and action sequences, settings and varied and unique characters, human and otherwise. Although it has mythic origins and thematic features, it is to a significant degree informed and inspired by modern science, technology, and contemporary thought. It involves imaginative and often detailed scenario building and thought experiments about the future, set in the form of stories. Science fiction stimulates and engages holistic future consciousness about the future of everything, and not simply the future of science and technology. 
In summary, science fiction stimulates and evolves holistic future consciousness, creating a total way of life and paradigm through the future, primarily centered around through narratives of the future, but tapping into all different aspects of human reality and human life. So let us begin our history, and let's begin with ancient history through the Middle Ages. Myth, the fantastical and the transcendent, the ideal, cosmic consciousness, invention, and progress from roughly 2000 BC up to 1500 AD. Now, the place I begin is with the fact that thousands of years ago, people believed in various deities who had tremendous fantastical powers, such as Isis being able to rise, Osiris from the dead, and Mercury being able to fly through space and the air with uh, a wings on his feet. So people believed in these fantastical beings that had incredible powers to them. And that's a piece that fits into what science fiction will turn into. People also had all of these great stories they told, such as the Odyssey and Jason and the Argonauts, where there were these fantastic adventures to strange and different lands where they encountered fantastic beasts and, and different beings with incredible powers. So indeed, uh, we have this early on belief that comes through, through myth of beings with fantastical powers, fantastic adventures and into strange and different lands. All of that's gonna feed into uh, uh, science fiction. We have Iphasis, Iphasis, excuse me, who was the god of metallurgy in Greek mythology, who created mechanical metallic beings that were animated. And we could take this as not only fantastical powers on the part of gods, but a first indication of the idea of robots. And indeed, robots would become a central theme in science fiction as it evolves too. One of the most influential uh, myths in science fiction, uh, in uh, ancient times that influenced science fiction, was Prometheus, who stole the secret of fire from the gods and gave it to humanity, and thus providing humanity with self determination. In fact, it was the myth to end myths, in that before myths primarily centered around gods and goddesses. And now man has become the master or humanity has become the master of his own destiny. And with negative repercussions associated with this, like the story of Pandora's box and the myth of Prometheus would have a big impact on many, many stories in science fiction. We also have the beginnings of, of thinking about social ideals and ideal societies like Plato's Republic. And that would become one significant strain in science fiction, which is can we envision ideal societies? Early on, we find Zoroaster or Zarathustra who envisioned a great battle at the end of time between the forces of good and evil, the battle of Armageddon. And Zoroaster believed in a progressive pattern to time that involved this great battle where the forces of evil were defeated. And the Battle of Armageddon will occur in many, many different forms as we come up to modern science fiction. Lucretius articulates an anti-supernatural vision of nature, gets rid of the gods, and articulates the beginnings of the idea of evolution. And all of that will input into science fiction. Perhaps the first science fiction story, in fact, dealing with outer space is Lucian's true history in 100 AD, in which Lucian talks about the colonization of the planet Venus by beings from the, from the moon and the sun. And so we have the beginnings of space adventure and space opera and space weaponry and a telescope in the story as well, too. So space exploration and space battles goes all the way back to Lucian. In St. Augustine's City of God, we have ideas about human evolution and human advancement, theologically informed 
and uh, produced through God, but still that man can have a better society than he does today, and that humans can become more advanced than they are today. As we move up into the Middle Ages, we have Roger Bacon and we have Leonardo da Vinci with all kinds of interesting technological inventions that later often became reality. And that would become an element in the history of science fiction too, technological invention, something new and creative. And toward the end of the Middle Ages, we have Ibn al-Nafas creating a synthesis of scientific and theological ideas and another one of the first science fiction novels about the end of the world in this case. Moving into the modern times, I have a quote up here from uh, of, of Fontenelle uh, commenting on the Copernican revolution. When the heavens appeared to me as only a blue vault, the universe appeared little and confined with the narrow bounds. I seemed depressed. Presently, the heavens give me an infinite extent and profundity to this blue vault. It seems to me that I breathe with more liberty, that I am in a much greater extent of air, and that the universe is far more magnificent. And Fontenelle is commenting there on the transformation of our vision of reality from the way the ancients saw it, where reality was very confined, to now we have the scientific revolution and the scientific transformation where the heavens open up and seem much vast, much vaster, more extensive than they ever were before. Now, a place to begin this period would be with Giordano Bruno, <clears throat> who believed in infinite worlds and infinite forms of beings on all of these different worlds. And for that, he was burned at the stake. But by the time we get up into the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, with Newton and Galileo and Copernicus and Spinoza, we have this vastly transformed vision of reality based on science, where the heavens now extend out much further and are much more complex and intricate than they ever appeared to humanity before. And that new theory of reality, which during this time they still combined with their religious and mythic ideas, was actually much more expansive and rich and different than the theory of reality of the ancients. Christian Huygens, another famous scientist at the time, uh, and Cosmo Theorist speculates on how uh, different creatures could have uh, developed on different planets throughout the solar system. So we have the beginnings of scientific thinking about aliens. <clears throat> Kepler in his Somnian or the Dream speculates on going to the moon where he meets inhabitants from the moon who live on the dark and light sides of the moon. And there's a little magic thrown into it, but Kepler here is the beginning of a whole series of novels that were written and going to the moon, another one being The Man in the Moon or a Discourse on a Voyage th Thinker, Thither, excuse me. Uh, so moon trips became common during the early part of the scientific revolution, beginning with Kepler. And then Fontenelle, who in his Plurality of Worlds book, uh, presented a very convincing case for both the Copernican vision of the, of the solar system and the universe and speculated about what these different worlds out there might be like. Very influential book. But also during this time, we found a whole slew of utopian visions. Remember going back to Plato, and now we have Thomas More with Utopia, the city of the sun, and then finally Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, which is a scientifically, technologically informed utopian uh, uh, vision that contains in it lots of predictions about how science and technology will improve life in the future. And these people thought often that these visions they had could be applied to contemporary society to transform it into beneficial ways. 
Now, here we have the Eskimo Nebula, discovered by William Herschel in 1787. And we're moving into the period of the Enlightenment and the idea of secular progress, which is going to be another key theme in the evolution of science fiction. A quote from Dennis Diderot, man will never be free until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. Now, one of the great spokesmen of the Enlightenment was Voltaire, and Voltaire wrote in 1730, wasn't published till 1750, uh, his book Micromagus about visitors from the, uh, uh, from the star Cirrus and the planet Saturn who come and uh, observe humanity and decide that we are infantile and stupid and narrow-minded and leave. But this is uh, probably the, one of the earliest examples of aliens coming to visit the Earth and observing humanity. And Voltaire was one of the great architects of the Enlightenment. As I just mentioned before, William Herschel uh, with his uh, uh, sister uh, were very instrumental in expanding our vision of the universe so that indeed it went in Herschel's mind, way beyond just simply our solar system. And Herschel speculated about whether there was life on the moon, and in fact, wrote a number of articles dealing with it. So astronomy really accelerates during the period of the Enlightenment, Herschel being one significant person in that evolution. <clears throat> we have Breton, who uh, was a French novelist who spoke about uh, traveling to the moon and traveling into outer space and uh, encountering aliens and traveling across the globe and, and encountering primitive humans or animal human-like creatures in different places. And Breton was a, 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 a significant critic of contemporary society and believed in the principle of sexual freedom and wrote a number of very imaginative books during the 18th century on uh, traveling through across the earth and traveling through outer space. Other books written during this time which have science fiction elements, Memoirs of the 20th Century, which is a story about messages coming back to the 18th century from the 20th century, and um, uh, Voyages to another, Other Planets, in which uh, humans explore other planets and find up there all of the ghosts of people that live down here on the earth and going into the earth, the journey of Niels Klemp into the underground where strange different beasts and creatures and humans are discovered underground, which is another theme that keeps coming up in science fiction of journeying into the interior of the earth. Condesay, who wrote his essay on the perfection or perfectibility of humanity, envisioning that humanity could evolve and develop and improve in the future. And he was one of the great spokesmen of the Enlightenment. And then finally, uh, uh, Mercier's The Year 2424, in which a man travels 400 years in five, in this case here was actually 600 years into the future, and observes a world that's much different than our own. And this is an early example of a kind of time travel, utopian vision created by one of the spokespersons of the, in, of the Enlightenment. And in fact, uh, Mercier thought that his book actually contributed to the French Revolution, providing a vision of an ideal society. So the Enlightenment believed in reason. They believed in science. They believed in uh, secular progress, that humanity could improve themselves. They had an optimistic vision of, of the future, a transformed vision of the future. But there was another side to the coin which was Romanticism. And Romanticism and the Gothic was a reaction in some ways against the Enlightenment. And both Romanticism and the Enlightenment provided the double-edged sword of science fiction. Enlightenment representing hope and wonder about the future in various ways, the Romantic and Gothic representing fear and terror over the future. The, the, uh, the, the Enlightenment representing reason, 
whereas the Romantic and Gothics emphasized emotion that to come at the future, to come at reality through emotion as opposed to reason. Gothic literature began with the castle of Otranto uh, by Ho Horace Walpole, in which we have uh, uh, ghost-like beings, we have fear, we have terror. And a little bit later on, Byron, who was one of the great advocates of romantic thinking, wrote a poem, Darkness, during the summer of darkness in Europe, and Byron saw the artist, not the scientist, as the hero. And Byron, together with Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley, and uh, their doctor, John Polidari, got together in uh, Lake Geneva, Switzerland one summer and had a contest to see who could write the scariest novel or tale. Out of that, Polidari eventually published The Vampire, but Mary Shelley eventually published Frankenstein. And Frankenstein became the classic romantic science fiction novel in which there's an expression of fear over the future, an expression of fear of science and what science could do. There is a, um, uh, a good deal of neurotic rumination in the novel without very much in the way of scientific speculation uh, or technological speculation. But Frankenstein would have a great influence on the history of science fiction uh, in that many stories were written that have a Frankenstein theme of there being a mad scientist or a Many, many stories in science fiction, in fact, would have a Frankenstein theme to them, where we have a scientist who does something that um, uh, pushes the limits and uh, their experiments backfire on them. And our scientific technological creations bite us. Um, And so as, as Brian Aldous said, Frankenstein is the modern theme, touching not only uh, a science, but man's dual nature, whose inherited ape curiosity has brought him both success and misery, the double-edged sword of science fiction, and of science for that matter. Around the same time, uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Francois Greenfield published The Last Man, which is probably one of the most depressing novels ever written about the end of humanity, which combines together theological and scientific ecological ideas and is in a sense maybe close to, but not quite the first real narrative story about the future, but a depressing future, uh, a future that uh, humanity ends up uh, dying and we have uh, a, 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 a romantic, unfulfilled relationship at the ending of it. Uh, but it fit very well into this notion of fear of the future and the end of humanity. So in sum, what romanticism brought to the picture here in terms of science fiction was that since man is above all future making, he is above all a swarm of hopes and fears the emotional dimension of future consciousness and the dual dimension of science fiction, of reason versus emotion, of hope versus fear, and those two elements, those two philosophies of the Enlightenment and Romanticism converge together to create what we think of as science fiction, the emotional and the intellectual. Now, if we move into the 19th century, we come to the extraordinary voyages and fearful mysteries of, of the time, the early 19th century from Poe to Jules Verne. And as a quote here, it is not the nature of the human mind to be contented. We must always either hope or fear. And that's from Jane Luden, kind of a restatement of what I just had up before from Gisette. Two early novels that were very significant in the history of science fiction, Jane Luden's The Mummy, or A Tale of the 22nd Century. This book is the first really detailed 
comprehensive narrative of the future involving the scientific pursuit of raising the dead back to life. And it is a kind of um, semi-comical and dark tale of a scientist obsessed with raising this dead mummy. And the mummy does come back to life. But at the end, it sort of combines together science and mysticism and religion. But around the same time, E.T.A. Hoffman published The Sandman, which was a very frightening tale about a man who falls in love with a robot, Olympia. And it's actually a more terrifying tale, I think, than Frankenstein was. These were written early on in the 19th century. A little bit later, we find Edgar Allan Poe, who pulls together mesmerism, hypnosis, science, the Gothic, the dead, um, and other, other horrific themes, and writes quite a few things about the future, writes quite a few things about psychologically strange phenomena and adventures, and would tremendously influence, who read him when he was young, Jules Verne. And Jules Verne becomes a key figure in the evolution, evolutionary history of science fiction. Beginning in the 1860s, Verne wrote more science fiction novels by far than anybody had written before. Uh, there was Journey to the Center of the Earth and Off on a Comet. He combined together uh, a great deal of detail with about nature and adventure with scientific technology. His heroes went from <clears throat> enlightened uh, scientists into mad scientists in Robar the Conqueror and Master of the World. He wrote books and, and stories on the future, Paris in the 20th century, and the year 20, uh, 2889, in which there are numerous detailed predictions about the future. And Verne became one of the significant figures in the history of science fiction. But he basically wrote before and was informed by pre-evolutionary thinking. So, Let's stop for five minutes, okay? Can we do that? Now we come to the latter part of the 19th century and the impact and influence of the theory of evolution. And we're gonna look at utopias, robots, fiends, the mystical and the Martians. And this is a great work of art by Albert Rubita, who was a famous author during that time and also was one of the early great science fiction artists. And this is a vision he has of the future with humans and flying cars. In 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man and co-published a second edition of the, on the origin of species. And Darwin provided a scientific and naturalistic explanation for the progression of time, for understanding past, present, and future. The Enlightenment philosophers had believed in the philosophy of progress, but Darwin provided a scientific theory of time transforming. And for some reason, and people could think this one out, right after Darwin published The Descent of Man, the frequency of science fiction or science fiction-like novels greatly accelerated. In fact, it has been suggested that in May of 1871, two months after the publication of Descent in Man, modern science fiction was born with the publication or submission for a publication of three classic science fiction novels, Erewhon by Samuel Butler, in which there's an expression very strong, a fear of the evolution of machines and machines taking control of human reality. The Coming Race by Edward Bueller Lytton, in which is a fear of uh, advanced humans evolving under the earth 
possessing cyborg-like capabilities and becoming a threat to humanity. And the Battle of Dorking, which is a fear expressed of Germany invading England, which provoked at least 400 future war novels over the next 40 years and got Europeans in a very paranoid mentality and preparedness for future war. Indeed, 20 years later, in one of the great future war novels, The Angel of the Revolution, we have this vast and immense destructive vision of aerial warfare among the powers or countries of Europe and across the globe. And indeed, there was, as I mentioned, hundreds of future war novels, The Angel of the Revolution being one of the most significant ones. But also influenced by evolution, Camille Flammarion popularized outer space, popularized interest in Mars, speculated through evolutionary eyes on how intelligent life would evolve on other planets, wrote in Omega a complete picture of all the different theories of the end of the world, and speculated how humanity could evolve into the far, far distant future. And Flammarion combined mysticism and science and had both an observatory and a seance room in his own. John Jacob Astor and A Journey in Other Worlds pr produced the first best-selling American science fiction novel, which was an intricate vision of future progress, economical and technological, and then a story of going into outer space in which various planets in the solar system are visualized, and then creating through the whole thing a synthesis of an evolutionary and theological vision of the uh, future of the cosmos. So something that has been going on all along the way here is even though science to some degree replaced religious and early mythical thinking, it was often combined together, such as in A Journey in Other Worlds, which is a very fascinating book to read, given it was written in 1895, roughly. There were a whole slew of, of novels about future human societies, the best being, I think, by Alba Rabida, the 20th century, from which this image is drawn, which is very prescient and very comical and looks at how humanity in Paris is transformed in the 20th century. Looking Backwards, which was a giant bestseller and presents a very positive, optimistic, utopian vision of the future and the year 3000 by Montezaga, which is a techno-optimistic vision of the future in the year 3000 in which we have learned how to read each other's minds. On the dark side, though, there was the psychological science fiction of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And then there was also a whole slew of short novels, dime novels, and then finally a very impressive book on robots, the steam men of the prairies and tomorrow's Eve. And in tomorrow's Eve, Thomas Edison becomes a hero in the story, a real life figure being put into a science fiction novel. And there's a very detailed description of how a robot could be created and what the relationship is between the body and the mind and the soul, a very fascinating book. But then there's also an interest in Mars, Kurt Laswitz, the Mars interest going back to Flammarion, wrote the most intricate description of a future alien, of an alien civilization, not future in his book, Two Planets. And then we have uh, Garrett Service, who was the most popular American science fiction writer, writing a story where Thomas Edison is the hero again of the Earth invading and conquering Mars. And now we come to the person who was most strongly influenced up to this point in time by the theory of evolution. And this is an image, an early image from The Time Machine by H.G. Wells where the time traveler is holding Weena and the Morlocks are trying to grab her. And note here that this image of the time traveler is very much the likeness of the image of H.G. Wells. 
And H.G. Wells saw himself as a traveler through time, a man of the future, a futurity man. And H.G. Wells became both the father of modern science fiction and the father of modern future studies. And he had a very powerful evolutionary vision of reality and the future. That is, he thought, saw things through the eyes of evolution. And to begin between 1895 and 1905, he wrote a whole series of classic science fiction novels um, on numerous themes such as time travel, biotechnology, alien invasions, mad scientists, human evolution, aliens on the moon, social structures, a fantastic uh, war novel, The War in the Air, about aerial war between European powers, and a dark uh, dystopian vision of the future of the sleeper awakes. He became immensely popular and influential through this series of novels. But around 1900, in the midst of writing these science fiction novels, he began to write nonfiction books about the future, including The Discovery of the Future, Anticipations. He wrote his biggest bestseller of all, The Outline of History. His thinking was, was intricate, informed by science, informed by history, the theory of evolution. And toward the end, he combined together his science fiction with his historical and future studies work in books like The World Set Free and Men Like Gods. And finally, his big masterpiece at the end, The Shape of Things to Come, in which he really integrates futurist thinking, historical scholarship, with a vision of the future of humanity into the next few centuries. So Wells was highly influential, influenced by the idea of evolution and wrote both an immense number of fiction and nonfiction books, contributing both to future studies and science fiction. Well, while Wells was writing his books and his stories in the early 20th century, there were a whole slew of dystopias, disasters, cosmic adventures, past and future journeys, and the emergence of science fiction cinema going on at the same time. Beginning with the cinema, we had Méliès um, as being the architect of early special effects and A Trip to the Moon and other uh, movies that he wrote. Alita, which is a um, uh, based on the novel Alita, which is a communist science fiction novel and movie with a fantastical central character, an incredible art deco. Then we have the most expensive movie ever made up to that point in time, Metropolis, created by Fritz Lang and his wife Thea von Harbo, who wrote the novel accompanying the movie and also wrote uh, for the later movie, Woman in the Moon, which was the best outer space science fiction movie produced up to that point in time. We have very famous world disasters that were written during that time, The Purple Cloud, Darkness and Dawn, and The Machine Stopped, which is a warning about humanity becoming too dependent on our technology written early in the 20th century and very prescient and a very influential popular science fiction uh, story about humanity's relationship with technology. There's some of the greatest dystopian novels written during this time too, The Messiah of the Cylinder, a Christian science fiction novel warning against the power of science, City of Endless Night, which is a warning against um, uh, uh, the rise of fascist Germany, and We, which is perhaps the best dystopian novel ever written, warning against communal consciousness and collectivity written during the communist revolution by Yevgeny Zamyatin. An excellent early novel about future human evolution, The Wonder, speculates on what an advanced human would be like. And this book would influence quite a few books that came later on how humanity, individual humans psychologically could evolve or change in the future. 
During this time, we found the beginnings of Russian cosmism, where Fyodorov and Tilakowski speculated on traveling into outer space. Tilakowski wrote both fiction and nonfiction, and were two of the great stimuli for the ongoing uh, amount of Russian science fiction writing that was written during the uh, 20th century. But they were really into themes like humanity achieving immortality, humanity spreading throughout the universe, which of course are basic science fiction themes. Edgar Rice Burroughs was the most popular writer of, of the time and wrote about going to other planets, including Mars and Venus, but also going into the interior of the Earth. He wrote 2025 fantastical adventure stories about Mars and about Martians, about Venus and Venusians. He, it was very action-packed, his, uh, his uh, fiction. And even though it combined together fantasy with science, um, he was a very influential, powerful figure in the history of science fiction. And um, actually wrote some novels about the future as well too, later on in his career. But well, uh, but Burroughs is, is one figure who definitely got into speculating on aliens. And Burroughs is a beautiful example of how many different alien kinds of Martian beings you could create, of which he created quite a few. Other journeys into outer space. Outer space becomes a big theme during this time. The Lunar Trilogy by Jerzy Solowski, Polish science fiction, A Columbus of Space, written by Garrett Service, where we go to Venus. And uh, Rosny the Elder, who goes to Mars and Navigators of the Future. Rosny of the Elder is the one who wrote the story Quest for Fire. And in Navigators of the Future, he wrote a story about a romantic relationship between a human and a Martian, which is very moving and daring, and wrote about the end of humanity and other stories, a very broad-based, influential writer, Distant Worlds by a major German science fiction novel, which seems to be the first novel about interstellar uh, space flight and traveling to other worlds. And the psychedelic of Voyage to Arcturus, in which a different kind of style emerges that we'll see later on, where it becomes less literal and more metaphorical. David Lindsay's A Voice Doctorus. Jack London travels backward in time where minds could reach back to ancient minds. And finally, probably the most imaginative novel of this period, The Nightland by William Hope Hotchins, which takes place in the far distant future about a trek across a world that is very different from today, filled with very, very strange and unusual realities and beings. Now, here's another great artist from the history of science fiction, Frank Paul, who wrote, who did lots of artwork for, for Hugo Gernsback, uh, covers for the magazines. And here's some alien visions, but also one of that he did of the shape of things to come as well. Um, and uh, Frank Paul would be uh, probably the most influential and fantastical artist of the 1920s into the 1930s. And here's where we introduce Hugo Gernsback, who's the one who popularized the term science fiction due to some various accidental events that occurred during his career. He was an editor, an entrepreneur, uh, published a whole slew of different science technology magazines in which he at one point wrote the novel Ralph 124C41+, which means Ralph 124C for the many and lots of technological predictions in there about the future. Gernsback formulated a theory of this new uh, literary genre, which he originally called science fiction, and came up with a history of it. His first, now, uh, first magazine dealing exclusively with science fiction was Amazing Stories. The cover there is from uh, uh, Jules Verne's uh, A Day on the Comet. In 1929, though, in a subsequent uh, magazine, Science Wonder Stories, 
is the first time he uses the expression science fiction. And he's the one, of course, who popularizes it, as I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> Gernsback was also uh, significantly uh, involved in creating the earliest science fiction communities, like the Science Fiction League, where uh, uh, readers would write letters into the editor. That is, he started to generate the social community of science fiction, which is, in fact, a big part of science fiction. He also cultivated many new writers including Verdon Baker, who wrote The Man from the Atom, and Gernsback published it and then realized Verdon Baker was 16 years old. Um, and he became an early significant science fiction writer publishing for Gernsback. Uh, Francis Flagg, uh, <clears throat> a vision of a technologically advanced human from the future visiting us. And he also mentored uh, Leslie Stone, who was one of the earliest women science fiction writers. And in particular, we should note, Stone wrote this classic story, The Conquest of Gola, which is a early feminist science fiction uh, uh, story. So Gernsback brought lots of new people into science fiction, popularized the term, uh, produced multiple different magazines dealing with science fiction. Well, while the magazines were being produced by Gernsback, there were some great novels being produced, too, during this time. Brave New World, which is a critique and satire on trends in contemporary society. War with the Newts by Car Carol Chopik, who is the person, together with his brother, who invented the term robot. A real excellent comprehensive satire of human society. The Man Who Awoke which is a prescient uh, vision of our environmental ecological future, but then go out thousands and thousands of years into the future and the evolution of humanity. When Worlds Collide, which is a popular human uh, earth disaster novel in which the earth is actually destroyed. Some great movies produced during that time, Frankenstein, Things to Come, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, in which Francis Frederick Mark, uh, March won the Academy Award for his best actor that year. The comics come into their own, science fiction comics, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, and the first of many superheroes, an alien from another world, Superman. During this time, some really powerful literary, imaginative, articulate, bizarre science fiction was written by a group of authors, Abraham Merritt, who wrote The Metal Monster, which is about a self-organizing technological intelligence made up out of trillions of different parts. H.P. Lovecraft, The Shadow Out of Time, which is about alien minds from the distant past moving through time and gaining control over the minds of contemporary humans and Lovecraft's friend, Clark Ashton Smith, who in a short period of time, as, as starting off as a poet, wrote some of the most literary and strange science fiction, including the, the monster of the prophecy. And note up there, and we have another science fiction magazine here, Astounding. And astounding would become <clears throat> taking the place of amazing stories in science. One of the stories, the most popular uh, science fiction magazine of the 1930s, the latter 1930s, Jack Williamson's The Legion of Time, which is a story of, a, of time wars, of people from different parts in time moving through time and warring with each other over who would control time. And during this period, we have Nat Shackner, in this case here, Crystallized Thought, who wrote more cover stories for Astounding than any other science fiction writer of the 1930s and delved into the future of everything, including in Crystallized Thought, the nature of mind and consciousness and reality, but he also delved into aliens and human society and intelligent uh, metal and um, uh, uh, future ecological disasters, an extremely broad and diverse 
set of stories written during the 1930s. But finally, during this time, we had the emergence of great space operas that uh, were published in Astounding and uh, a magazine. Uh, we have the beginnings of, of uh, interstellar groups cooperating together. Uh, Edmund Hamilton's The Interstellar Patrol, which is a precursor of Star Trek. And we have the uh, Chronicles of the Lensman by Doc Smith, in which we have gigantic spaceships, gigantic battles, immense technological powers traveling faster than the speed of light. Our heroes are combinations of flesh and technology. They're cyborgs. We have an incredible conspiracy theory that the aliens are controlling us, and there's good aliens, and there's bad aliens. And Doc Smith would write the most mammoth, gargantuan space operas up to that point in time, beginning in magazines, but then eventually moving over into novels. And at this point, we come to Olaf Stapleton. Uh, Olaf Stapleton was English, just like H.G. Wells was, and was influenced by evolution, like H.G. Wells was, except perhaps more so. Olaf Stapleton was a philosopher, a poet, and a psychologist, and he wrote cosmic evolutionary perspectives on the future of humanity and the universe that far exceeded anything anybody had written before in terms of scope. A quote, besides his stupendous panorama, his visions of worlds, galaxies, of the cosmos pile upon cosmos, the glimpses of the future that Wells and others have provided are no more than penny peep shows. His five significant science fiction novels, Last and First Men, Last Men in London, Odd John, Star Maker, and Steerus. Cirrus were written during the 1930s and early 1940s, and Arthur C. Clarke has described Star Maker as probably the most powerful work of imagination ever written. And in these novels, Stapleton wrote Grand Futures narratives extending billions of years into the future. He had a much more thorough evolutionary vision of humanity, ethics, and reality than even Wells did. He was colossally imaginatively inventive, both with aliens and with technology and with the future of the universe running out 30 billion years. His central focus, though, was purposeful mental, social, ethical evolution, that he had an enlightenment vision of the future, and he envisioned a cosmic mind emerging in the future of the universe. He was highly philosophical. He articulated preferable futures, but they were tragic, and they were dramatic, and they had a wisdom narrative quality to them, and he integrated future studies with science fiction. So Wells, is, uh, excuse me, so Stapleton is a uh, another key figure along the Gernsback and Wells and uh, Jules Verne in the ongoing evolution of science fiction. And next to Wells is probably the most influential science fiction writer ever. And here we come to Gort. And Gort is a character in Harry Bates' Farewell to the Master, which is a story on which... The Day the Earth Stood Still, the movie was based. And Gort uh, is a, 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 a significant figure representing some of the ideas that emerged during the 1940s in the golden age of science fiction. Future histories, robots, aliens, human evolution, dystopias, time travel, and the fall of humanity. 1938, Orson Welles, The War of the Worlds, the radio show in which People in the United States are apparently totally shocked and believe in the fact that the Martians are invading us. And that sort of sets the stage for the paranoia and fear of the 1940s when, when uh, war breaks out across the globe. In 1938, though, John Campbell, the writer of Who Goes There, a classic science fiction horror story, becomes editor of Astounding Magazine. And John Campbell has in his mind a vision of, a, of an improved form of science fiction, 
a kind of science fiction which could actually impact and benefit the evolution and his, uh, the evolution and future of humanity. Gernsback had had that same idea that science fiction could somehow benefit us in a human society. The most popular writer that Campbell cultivated was Robert Heinlein, who wrote it, an incredible assortment of diverse stories about the future, biotechnology, time travel, space travel. He wrote a whole series of stories that were collected together as a future history in his uh, a collection, The Past Through Tomorrow. A second key writer that Campbell definitely mentored was Isaac Asimov, who wrote his I, Robot stories and wrote uh, his foundation series in which a scientist develops a mathematical formula for predicting the future, but something goes wrong. And one of the great villains of science fiction, the mule emerges with upsets the whole trajectory of the future of humanity. But the best novel about robots was actually written by Jack Williamson uh, called The Humanoids, in which the robots have as their prime directive to serve and protect humanity and that very simple directive backfires on us and we become like children protected by these robots who won't let us do anything that is all dangerous or risky. Great novel. A third significant writer here was A.E. E. Van Vock, who wrote a, a, a story of future human evolution slam about super evolved humans and science fiction uh, readers and fans actually identified with Slan as if they were like Slan, that they called themselves Slans, that they were somehow more evolved than the general population. We have the husband and wife team of uh, Henry Cutner and Catherine Moore, and they became um, a, a significant voice during the 1940s, and Moore became, up to that point, the best woman science fiction writer so far to come on the scene. We had new comics and provoked by World War II, Captain America, and Wonder Woman. And we had a number of excellent science fiction novels outside of the magazines, Swastika Night, predicting uh, the Thousand Year Reich, um, 1984, a bleak vision of an authoritarian totalitarian society out of the silent planet, a Christian science fiction novel, started uh, uh, What Mad Universe, a science fiction novel about science fiction, the ecological end of the world story, Earth Abides, and a story in which dogs and robots become the central figures in the future city, which I thought was the best novel of this period. Now, a new image. This is from Alpha Ralpha Boulevard by Cornwiner Smith. And here we have Galaxy Magazine, a new magazine that came out in the 1950s. And on the cover is uh, the image for the Bell of Lost Camel by Cornwiner Smith, who was a very popular writer, very colorful, lyrical, literary. And, uh, and Camel on the cover is a cat-human hybrid. And so Cornwiner Smith was one of the new writers to emerge during the Silver Age. Awards came in at this point, the Hugo and the Nebula. So science fiction began to give itself awards. The first novel to win the Hugo was The Demolished Man by Alfred Bester. And Bester wrote two of the most famous science fiction novels of all time during the early 50s, The Demolished Man and The Star's My Destination. And both of them were psychological, electrical kind of crazy and intense stories about human madness and about revenge and about telepathy. And they were sort of anticipatory of the kind of stories that would come later in science fiction. But other important writers of the period were the cosmic and a little bit mystical Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote Humanity Being Evolved by Aliens in Childhood's End, and religious theme science fiction, The Nine Billion Names of God and The Star. And he went on to write 2001, where humanity again is facilitated in its evolution by aliens. And Clark was a big advocate for space travel. 
the literary, very popular Ray Bradbury, who wrote Fahrenheit 451, which people think is coming through today, and the Martian Chronicles, in which we invade Mars and destroy the Martians. Robert Heinlein continued to be popular in the 1950s. The great war science fiction novel, Star Trek Dupers, Stranger in a Strange Land, the hippie science fiction novel, and The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Stanislaus Lem became one of the most popular science fiction writers globally, and Solaris intelligently delves into alien intelligence and what it would be like if it was in some strange and different form. In this case here, a whole planet being intelligent. Science fiction movies become immensely more popular in the 50s and 60s, as well as science fiction TV. Forbidden Planet was perhaps what I thought was the best one of the period, but H.G. Wells had a number of his novels made into movies, and they made Farewell to the Master into the day. There were a whole slew of other good novels written during the time. The Space Merchants, Brainwave, Flowers for Algernon, Dune, Bring the Jubilee, in which we are actually in a alternate reality that has been changed due to somebody having traveled through time more than human, as well as brainwave being visions of future human evolution. And of course, Flowers for Algernon made into the movie, uh, Charlie. Philip K. Dick emerged during this time and Philip K. Dick became one of the most popular science fiction writers of the next couple of decades. And Dick questioned reality. Dick questioned our sanity. Dick questions our personal notion of who we are. The Man in the High Castle is an alternate reality novel in which Germany and Japan won World War II. Uh, and Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep was eventually made into the movie Blade Runner. Vallis talks about aliens communicating to us through our minds, and Dick believed that he actually was communicating with aliens through his mind. An ubik in which we have a hard time figuring out who is really dead and who is really alive in the story. But the best novel, I think, of this period was a synthesis of religion, history, philosophy, and science fiction, A Canical for Leibowitz by Walter Miller. And people usually will rate this in the, one of the top five best science fiction novels of all time. And now here's an image from A Rose for Ecclesiastes, the a magazine cover by Roger Zelazny, came out a magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and the cover art was done by Hans Bach. And this is a picture of Braxa holding the rose, and Rose for Ecclesiastes is a story about uh, culture, alternative cultures, seduction, humanistic psychological themes, and it's a different kind of science fiction now, uh, story. It's not so much about science as it is about the human heart. It becomes much more of a psychological story than a science and text story. And that sort of ushers in a new era in science fiction, the new wave. And there's a quote from Philip Jose Farmer, a, a, one of the key figures in the new wave. If Jules Verne could have really looked into the future, say 1966, he would have crapped in his pants. And the new wave was during the period of 65 to 80. It was a period of increased eroticism, of the taboo, of the blasphemous, the dangerous, the lyrical, the metaphorical the obscene, the psychedelic, the maniacal, the catastrophic, social activism, and the literary avant-garde. It was almost intentionally created by Michael Morka, who became the editor of New World Magazine in Great Britain in, in uh, 1964. And Morka <clears throat> brought together a bunch of new writers who he wanted to break out of the constraints of traditional science fiction, and he wanted to participate in the new culture of the 1960s that was um, anti-establishment, and he wrote an extremely jolting story, uh, among many, many others, novel, about a man who goes in search of Christ in a time machine and finds Christ and is very surprised. The most 
A significant writer that Moorcock cultivated was J.G. Ballard, who wrote psychedelic and uh, inner space and strange critical uh, stories that were filled with literary experimentation, uh, the Crystal World and the Atrocity Exhibition. And J.G. Ballard eventually wrote his a semi autobiograph autobiography and Empire of the Sun, which was uh, made into a movie. They also published, Moorcock did, Bug Jack Barron, which was banned because it was obscene and vulgar as a critique and satire on TV uh, written about our future. And No Direction Home, Spinrad wrote, about everybody in the world becoming drug addicted and nobody is straight anymore. A real advocate of new wave writing was Harlan Ellison, who collected lots of his stories that were new wave writer, writing together in dangerous visions and wrote jolting, visceral, offensive, violent, crazy stories like I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream and retold the story of Genesis and Deathbird. Significant new age writers of which, new wave writers, of which there were each of them wrote many, many great novels. Philip Jose Farmer, The Lovers of Sex with Aliens. Son of Man, psychedelic story about a multiplicity of future humans. Roger Zelazny, techno-enhanced Hindu deities and the Buddha in the future. Kurt Vonnegut, another significant writer of the New Wave, the most popular in pop culture writer of the period, wrote Slaughterhouse Five and Cat's Cradle, a black satirical comical vision of, uh, of moving through time, becoming unglued in time, of aliens who know the end of the world, the end of the universe. Joe Haldeman's critique of war and of war, science fiction war novels, the Forever War, in which the central character is a marijuana smoking kind of hippie-ish character who's stuck in the army for thousands of years. The man who folded himself in which through time travel, a man has sex with himself and the mysterious and enigmatic new wave-like roadside picnic about aliens visiting us and leaving their garbage, which become very valuable to people and the Strugatsky brothers, Russian science fiction writers. Movies of the time, Planet of the Apes, Fantastic Planet, which is very imaginative and strange. And Stanley Kubrick with incredible science fiction movies of that period, Strange Love in 2001 and A Clockwork Orange. And <clears throat> Clockwork Orange is probably the most new wave one of the bunch, but also more on the traditional side, Star Trek emerges on TV and starts a subculture in and of itself in the late 1960s, moving into the 1970s. The big thing, though, in science fiction during this time was the emergence of women science fiction writers as a real dominant voice, beginning with Ursula Le Guin and two of the great science fiction novels of the era, The Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed. And jo uh, Joanna Russ, the extreme feminist novel, The Female Man, and James Tiptree Jr., who everybody thought was a man and turned out to be a woman, and her smoke rose up forever. But the, probably the best science fiction novel of the era was Stand on Zanzibar by John Brunner, which is information dense and electrical and massive and literary impression and filled with ideas about a future world which is crazy and frenetic and information overload and just a very impressive piece of work dur written during the uh, latter part of the 1960s. Moving into the 1980s, Star Wars and cyberpunk, the dreams our stuff is made of, how science fiction conquered the world, Everything is looking more like science fiction and science fiction is looking more like everything else. John Clute. Uh, Thomas Dish, who was a science fiction writer of the New Wave, published The Dreams Our Stuff is Made Of in uh, the year 2000 and argued that science fiction has influenced and infused itself into all aspects of human life and in a sense has conquered the world through our technology, through our customs, through our culture, that as science fiction has become an extremely powerful force in human reality, modern human reality. 
And it's an excellent overview of all the different ways in which science fiction has influenced us in the last 50, 60 years. But in particular, in the 1980s, science fiction conquered the world through the movies in which spectacular blockbusting, blockbuster, epical movies were created beginning with Star Wars, becoming the most popular, biggest money-making movies of the time. And in fact, science fiction movies have stayed since then, always most of the biggest money-making popular movies oh, since the time of Star Wars. That's the last 40 years. Our cinema is dominated by science fiction, including such uh, movies as the Terminator, the Terminator series, the Batman series, all the Star Trek movies, Back to the Future, Mad Max, Predator, that is an, an Akira, which comes out of Japan and, and manja and anime. In, uh, science fiction movies have really permeated out into our popular culture and we identify with them. But I think the two best science fiction movies of the era, which weren't big blockbusters, were Brazil by Terry Gilliam, an alternate history, uh, very comical and satirical, and Blade Runner, which was based on Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was cyberpunk in quality, which I'm going to come to in a moment, and was a very uh, gritty and visceral and powerful psychological science fiction movie, which since has become a classic and is usually regarded as one of the best, and I consider it maybe the best science fiction movie ever made. But during this time for artists, we had Giger, and Giger combined together the mechanical, the biological, the, the uh, erotic and the horrific, and probably the most inventive and bizarre art of the period. And in fact, he created in the image you see up there, the original image of Alien, which was then made into a movie. In the 1980s though, there was lots of literature and scholarship as well. This is the beginning of the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction by Peter Nichols and then John Klug came on later on. And the encyclopedia continues now online and is probably the best resource if you're interested in science fiction is go look at the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. During the 1980s, David Brin wrote the uplift novels in which um, uh, dolphins, chimpanzees and gorillas are technologically and biologically advanced and facilitated, uplifted to become equal partners with humanity and incredible assortment, inventive assortment of aliens, really great novels written during that time. And Bryn has continued to write science fiction novels up through present time. Ender's Game, The Ender Saga, Speaker for the Dead, Orson Scott Card, one of the most popular novels of the 1980s. And Orson Scott Card is a theoretician and teacher of science fiction and has an immense website if one is interested in going and have a look at that. Douglas Adams, who produced The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a series of novels that became one of the biggest selling science fiction novel series of all time, comical, irreverent, inventive, and permeated out into TV, radio, the movies. The most highly acclaimed from a literary point of view novel series was The Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe, in which we have a far future, fantastical, strange combination of magic and science vision of an extremely bizarre reality in some unimaginably distant Earth. Women science fiction writers of the period, Vonda McIntyre, Dreamscape, Dream Snake, excuse me, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, which eventually moved its way onto TV, and um, The Snow Queen, which is a very inventive and romantic novel about an about a few about a different world. Uh, but in the 80s, cyberpunk emerged as well. And this is an image of the two central characters from the cyberpunk novel Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. And this is a different kind of science fiction, just as Moorcock in the New Wave and Campbell 
in the golden age and Gernsback in the early 1920s all had ideas about how science fiction should transform, further evolve, develop, and how it could influence human society. <clears throat> A bunch of writers got together in the 1980s, Gibson, Sterling, Shirley, and Rucker, and decided they were going to create a new kind of science fiction, which became cyberpunk. And these are the two characters from cyberpunk's great classic Snow Crash. So there's a whole slew of different cyberpunk novels, uh, also Mirror Shades, which is a collection of stories from cyberpunk. And cyberpunk is anti-establishment, punk protagonist philosophy, high-tech computer virtual reality world, human machine syntheses, evolving from the anti-establishment rebellious new wave and Philip K. Dick, but would have a tremendous influence on pop culture. That is the cyberpunk mytho the cyberpunk um, vision and ideas about the future would really influence pop culture. And between these various novels up through and including Snow Crash and the Diamond Age, these are some of the classic cyberpunk novels written during the 80s and then into the 90s. This, the Diamond Age is actually not quite cyberpunk. It's computer technology and nanotechnology, but it sort of goes together with Snow Crash. There's two great novels that Stevenson wrote in the um, uh, late 80s into the early 90s. Now we move into the 1990s. And here's an image that Jim Burns, a contemporary science fiction artist, created for the um, uh, novel Eon, which is a, a, a very imaginative and cosmic vision of a strange reality that humans encounter. And this is the interior of this immense um, enclosed uh, object that comes into our solar system. Uh, and the key thing during the 1990s is that science fiction novels evolved in scope and comprehensiveness and world building in detail and literary quality. We had a real quantum jump in the level of science fiction novels. But I should note at the beginning that there were some significant and very good science fiction movies. The Matrix which would influence both pop culture and scientific thinking about the nature of reality. The uh, Dark City, alien conspiracy controlling our minds. Another Terry Gillian movie, 12 Monkeys, after having done Brazil, great time travel story. And Terminator 2, which was one in a series of an incredibly long list of Terminator movies. And this, I think, was the best of the bunch produced in the uh, uh, 1990s. But beginning with the novels, and the novels is where the 1990s really sticks out for science fiction. We have Hyperion by Dan Simmons, a series of novels set in 2800 AD and further out, in which we have super AIs, an interstellar civilization. We have the reincarnation of John Keats. We have the rise of the Catholic Church, we have the Grand Inquisitor and the Dalai Lama reappear. We have the Second Coming, and we have immortality being achieved by selling your soul to the devil. Rich, intricate, literary, highly imaginative. I recommend them to people when they say, I haven't read any science fiction. I say, read the Hyperion series. Also, Mammoth in Scope. A Fire Upon the Deep and a Deepness in the Sky by Venor Vinci. Vinci is the creator of the modern notion of the technological singularity. These novels take place 10,000 years into the future. Great space opera, great aliens, aliens with communal minds, a galactic internet, and a computer virus that spreads across the Milky Way. Greg Beard, Nanotechnological Evolution and Blood Music. 
delving into the mind of madmen, psychotechnology, and computers becoming self-aware and queen of angels. An excellent treatment about the next evolutionary step in our um, in humanity's history and Darwin's radio and literally moving Mars in the novel Moving Mars. But the most famous series, most realistic, best things ever written on Mars were Ken Stanley Robinson's um, utopian, highly comprehensive social ecological visions of the future colonization and settlement of Mars and Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. The most cosmic writer, though, of the era, Stephen Baxter, wrote a epical saga of maybe 15, 20 novels that takes place across the entire history of the universe in a battle between the forces of matter and antimatter, and humans are sort of small little players in the whole thing. The Zeely versus the Fotina birds, omnibus, vacuums, diagrams, and many, many others that fall into this series of novels. He wrote the sequel to The Time Machine, in which he delves into the metaverse in the time ships. And he wrote a history of humanity's ancestors into millions of years into the future in his book, Evolution, which is an excellent book on just understanding the concept of evolution. But the most scientifically high-powered, mathematically high-powered, difficult and challenging to read, and creative and inventive writer of the era was Greg Gigan, still writing, virtual reality, virtual realities created in virtual realities, humanity becoming a uh, 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 nanotechnological, robotic, virtual reality empowered and spreading out through the universe, of encountering metaverses, encountering alternate universes, different laws of nature in Schoen's Ladder, which some people will state is the hardest science fiction novel ever written. But Greg Egan is a real mental, psych, mental intellectual trip, for sure. Women writers, Octavia Butler, The Violent Parable of the Talents, which won Best Novel of the Year, Biotechnology and Beggars for Spain, and Grass, which contains a fascinating love story between a, 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 a human and an alien, and I think was the best novel of the era written by a woman science fiction writer. Steampunk emerges, an alternate reality based on an alternate history and with various strange and different technologies, Egyptian gods and ghosts and bizarre creatures thrown in along the way, Infernal Devices, one of the funniest science fiction novels I've ever read. And sort of as the highlight on the whole thing, Brittle Innings, which is an imaginative combination of the Frankenstein story and baseball. And I would say it's the most powerful and interesting and, um, and fascinating Frankenstein story ever written, better than Shelley's by far, but combining baseball with, with Frankenstein. No way to, I can go into more detail, but it's just something you have to read. But that sort of, in my mind, turned out to be one of the best novels of the 1990s. Now we move into the last two decades, the new millennium, the new where, the singularity, and beyond. Here's a Garuda contemplating his fate, looking across at Perdido Street Station in the city of Crucibam. And I'll come back to that story in a moment, but this is a very compelling image from a novel of the uh, first millennium. Some great science fiction movies, Watchmen, the greatest uh, best graphic novel in science fiction ever ever written, made into a movie, which I thought was the best movie of the first decade. Avatar, the most beautiful movie. The Cell, which is a cinematic version of Queen of Angels, going into the mind of a madman. Philip K. Dick's stories keep coming out in movie form, The Minority Report, and Star Trek starts a whole new uh, a series of movies in uh, uh, Star Trek, uh, the new series with a new set of characters, uh, a new set of actors playing the same set of characters from the original. But very significantly, Battlestar Galactica on TV 
became unquestionably the best science fiction ever produced on TV up to that point in time and was an indication of what was to come. Science fiction TV would immensely evolve in quality, beginning especially with Battlestar Galactica early on in the uh, new millennium. Battlestar Galactica is great special effects, incredible assortment of interesting characters, mystical, religious, epical, the end of humanity, the end of the earth, the search for a new place to go, a new world to inhabit. Uh, incredible piece of work produced in the early part of the 21st century on TV. Alternate realities became very popular in this first decade. Hominids in which we uh, encounter a Neanderthal civilization in a parallel universe who become evolved and modern like us, and we compare us with them. The Yiddish Policeman's Union, which won all the awards the year it came out about an alternate reality in which uh, the Jews are given Alaska as a, a place to settle and have a nation, and a new messiah is murdered, and a police detective up there has to investigate the murder. Very imaginative novel. Two great, two great psychological science fiction stories of the era. Spin, a romance that lasts for five billion years. The Speed of Dark, which is a story of an autistic individual from their perspective and the opportunity to become normal and the contemplations and thoughts on that. Great space operas, Ian B Banks with his culture series, cyborg civilization, super advanced, incredibly complex worlds, a psychedelic retelling of 2001 in light, and another answer to the Fermi paradox of why we don't see any indication of aliens in the sky in uh, Revelation space. Computer technology would influence uh, uh, science fiction a lot during this uh, decade. Accelerando, the singularity comes, seems to be written on speed when I first read it, an incredible trip through the next hundred years as humanity is transformed and uh, 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 technological intelligence begins to swallow up the solar system. The rapture of the nerds in which we achieve virtual immortality, little brother in which uh, computer technology and the web is watching over us and the struggle against it. And the quantum thief, which is outer space, computer technology, the singularity, virtual reality, Mars, and a few other significant themes all thrown together into an immensely imaginative, interesting uh, a novel the, um, uh, written by the Finnish science fiction writer, Hanna Rajanimi. Now, the three key writers, though, that I want to emphasize in this period are Ian McDonald, who wrote three science fiction masterpieces in, in a 10 year period about non European American cultures, River of Gods about future India, Brazil about future and past Brazil, and the Dervish House about future Istanbul. They are literary, historically informed, intricate filled with super AIs and multiverses and time travel and Hindu gods turned into technological consciousness and manipulations of alternate realities fighting against each other and drugs and a man made entirely out of honey. Just three amazing creations of imagination and intellect in those three novels. The, the writer who's won the most, neb most nebulous and Hugo's ever, Connie Willis, wrote a whole series of significant novels and many, many stories during this time having to do with time travel, to say nothing of the dog, which is maybe the funniest science fiction novel I've ever read, going back to the 19th century with time travel, Doomsday Book, where the character goes back to the Black Plague in the 13th century, 14th century, one of the grimmest uh, science fiction novels ever written, and but a very powerful piece of work, and where we go back in time to World War II and become stranded there in Blackout and All Clear, and all of those won Best Novel of the Year. 
China Meeve, although who I have the image of from Perdido Street Station, Perdido Street Station, in which you see a cover of Lin, who is half human and half insect, Perdido Street Station is one of the craziest, most imaginative, fantastical, bizarre novels ever written in science fiction of an alternate reality combining science fiction and fantasy and horror with an amazing variety of strange, intelligent creatures. The Scar, which is a pirate science fiction novel, and Embassy Town, which is one of the best treatments ever done on the challenges and difficulties of communicating with an alien mind that literally thinks totally differently with a different mode of consciousness in fundamental ways than we do. And it's done very well, humans trying to make sense out of and communicate with these very strange aliens. And then finally, we're coming to the last decade of the uh, 21st century. Everything, everywhere, everyone, all at once, the last decade. Some significant movies produced during the time, for one example, everything, everywhere, all at once. And if you don't count The Shape of Water, it's the first science fiction movie to one best picture of the year. Cinegraphic, cin cinematography orchestration was incredible, just like in Cloud Atlas, which deals with human destiny, another great movie of the last 10 years, other very significant movies, the social contemporary affair of satire, Don't Look Up, the excellent treatment of the Turing test in Ex Machina, the super time travel movie Predestination, maybe the best science fiction movie ever done on time travel. But I should note that the most popular, biggest money-making movies are all the superhero movies, all the Marvel Avenger movies. And I wouldn't necessarily call them that great in quality, but they continue the tradition of science fiction movies being the big blockbusters. But as I mentioned, science fiction TV took off in this last decade. Black Mirror, very jolting, commentaries on the near future, produced out of Great Britain, really excellent individual episodes. Watchmen, a further development of the Watchmen story, the best cinematic presentation of the Black experience in science fiction. And Dark, produced out of Germany, which is maybe the best TV series on time travel about a group of interacting neurotics who get into super convoluted time loops going back and forwards in time. Really excellent, complex, really got to pay attention to it, TV series. Finally, though, is another really super great one on TV, The Expanse, which is based on James Corey's Leviathan Wake's Expanse science fiction series. And The Expanse is a super space opera, excellent imaginative aliens, complex future world involving the entire solar system and uh, 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 comprehensive world building, uh, highly recommend watching it. The novel is, on the other hand, very good too, the whole series. They also made the movie, uh, the, the novel, The Martian, into a movie. In fact, during the time we get some uh, adaptations of various novels into movies, which I'll mention. And The Martian was one of them, which is a very popular novel, very popular movie. Another one was Ready Player Mun, great novel. Pretty good movie, virtual reality, virtual gaming, uh, uh, crossing over three different modes of experience between gaming and movies and novels, and very interesting novel about the intricacies of uh, gaming in the future. Uh, 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 veteran science fiction writers like William Gibson and Neil Stevenson continue to publish very good novels like The Peripheral and Neil Stevenson. But the one who stands out here is Ken Stanley Robinson, who wrote a series of environmental ecological science fiction novels, including The Ministry of the Future, which just came out last year, in which uh, Ken Stanley Robinson presents an encyclopedic, didactic, comprehensive analysis 
of contemporary society, politics, economics, the environment, and constructs out of that a narrative of how we can create a better world in the future and save humanity from the ecological environmental disaster that we're heading toward. It's a very high powered book intellectually, mentally, but he tries to create an answer in this book to how to get out of the environmental mess that we're in today and the economic mess that we're in today. The best short story writer of this last 10, 15 years, Ted Chiang, who wrote the story of your life, which was made into the movie Arrival, and has written two, has put together two collections of short stories. And the first volume, Stories of Your Life, is an excellent treatment of future mental human evolution. Understand. And exhalation, the story that the second volume is based on, is a really imaginative treatment of a robot in an alternate reality dissecting its own brain and trying to understand how its brain works. Super good stories, Ted Chan, combining science with alternate realities in various strange and unusual settings. John Scalzi has been a very popular writer of the last 10 years. Um, old Man's War, if you're given a new body to fight in a war in which you may die, but you could live forever, would you take it? And very strange, comical science fiction novels about Star Trek and about Godzilla, both of which won uh, Best Novel of the Year, Red Shirts and the Keiju Preservation Society. Two super alien novels, Annihilation and Children of Time, very imaginative, strange, bizarre visions of aliens in those two. And Tchaikovsky and Van der Meer have become very popular writers of the last 10, 15 years. But what's very noticeable of the last 10 years is that the majority of Hugo and Nebula and Locus Awards for best novel of the year have gone to women. Ancillary Justice, Ships that have consciousness, the calculating skies, excuse me, the calculating stars, an alternative vision of the space race, a memory called empire about minds downloading into minds, um, among others, a science fiction story about science fiction as a way of life. And the list goes on. But I would pick out as among all of these novels of the last 10 years written by women that have won the awards, all the Birds in the Sky is the Best, which is a combination of artificial intelligence, ecological disaster, super science, trying to save the world through science and technology, woven together with witchcraft and talking birds and talking trees. It's a real mental trip, and I would recommend it as you know, the, one of the best novels in science fiction of the last 10 years. But... What I should note in conclusion, what emerged in this last 10 years was the three body problem phenomena written back 15 years ago in China, translated into English, the three body problem trilogy ended up winning the Hugo and the Locus for best novel of the year. It's being trans, uh, it's being put into both uh, TV and movie form, both in English and in uh, China. It is a complex weaving together of Chinese history, Chinese culture, super science, aliens, contacting aliens, and the aliens deciding that we, the earth looks like an interesting place to move to. A fantastic series of novels and has uh, achieved a lot of fame and notoriety. And along with his other story made into a movie, The Wandering Earth, um, <clears throat> Shan Lu exhibits an optimism about the future that sometimes is lacking in Western writers. And I put these in at the end because one thing that in future iterations of this history of science fiction I want to get more into is I want to get more into non-European American science fiction, of which there is a lot going on in our contemporary world, and in China is one place in particular. And John Liu is one of the great contemporary Ch Chinese science fiction writers, and he has made a big mark now over in the West, both in his novels and in the adaptations to him through the uh, uh, TV and cinema. So, 
In conclusion, last slide. Science fiction is escape into reality. It is fiction, which concerns itself with real issues, the origin of man, our future. In fact, I can't think of any literature which is more concerned with real issues than reality, Arthur C. Clarke. And second, we're in a science fiction novel as a culture. Science fiction is the realism of our time, Kim Stanley Robinson. In summary, there's this interactive relationship between science fiction and human society and thinking. The history of science fiction involves a history of human thought. Science fiction predicts, prescribes, speculates, reflects, inspires, warns, artistically elevates, personally engages, expands our consciousness. It does many, many different things. It doesn't just simply predict. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it prescribes. Sometimes it reflects on the way things are. It's multimedia and psycho, psychosocially holistic, involving modes of life and experience. Uh, it's evolutionary, cumulative and transcending. There's an ongoing evolution of speculative futurist realities, concepts and themes, literary styles and philosophies. It's pluralistic visions and voices and styles. It's about the future of everything from the cosmos to psychology, society, economics, politics, ethics, wisdom and enlightenment. If you're interested in looking at my list on the best science fiction novels and movies, you can go to my evolving list on my websites, all-time best science fiction novels and movies. And that is uh, the end with another great piece of graphic from Terry. So we'll stop. Excuse me. We just had a slight edit.